Cross now to Lewis. Handball through to Dren, and that'll do it. A terrific comeback from Port Adelaide, and they powered on from there. They are right back in finals contention, Port. Winners. Alrighty, hello and welcome to the Creedcast. My name is Dave, and as always, massive appreciation for everyone that's joining us. And in particular, at this time of the year, um, I'm not. I'm very cognizant to the fact that the the download numbers drop when it comes to the women's season. And uh, no shade to any anyone that drops off after the men's season. You know, some of us only have so much bandwidth, but really, really appreciate everyone that's continuing on with us as we go through the women's season because they absolutely deserve the love. Especially, I mean, even if they were continuing on a, you know a rough rough build to where they're going but the last couple of weeks have been incredible like uh, the Carlton win last week that we reviewed incredible and this week the win over West Coast over at Mineral Resources Park uh, a, an incre- a kind of a nice fun way to go into this is like that's the first place that we ever played a major like an AFLW game uh, West Coast is a team that we've played every year that, every year since we've been in the competition so it's like there's a little bit of you know just you know, limit testing that goes on with that. I think we probably should have won the first game we played against West Coast. Uh, I see Jamie nodding as I'm, I'm saying that. I just remember that game, just thinking, fucking umpires. Like, one game into AFLW fandom as a Port fan, I was like, already going, you fucking, fucking maggots out there. <laughs> um, but this week we won 7 7 49 to 5 6 36 over in the West. Uh, and a scoreline that um, is really intriguing because at quarter time we were. You know, three one to not troubling the score is down, and by the end of it, that score line of seven seven five uh, seven seven four nine to five six thirty six actually flattered West Coast because uh, we held on to a twenty point lead for much of the last quarter, and uh, they just got one with a minute to go, and they also got one with a minute to, uh, well after the siren in the third quarter. So essentially, the entire second half was um, yeah quite a dominant performance and poor, and really right from the end of the first quarter. Um, I didn't get to watch it live. I had a big day of moving and then had a, a went down to Adelaide to see some music and just couldn't fit it into my day, which I always hate. And I've said that in the podcast before. I love watching them live because you get it. There's a I've watched it obviously on replay since and the and the mini, but um, there's this unique perspective you get from watching a game live. And I'm glad my co-host Jamie, who's just locked in all the time. Watched it live and 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 uh, watched most of it live and got and got the kind of emotionality out of it that I failed to get because I didn't get didn't get to watch it live but love watching the replay. Jamie, how was it watching this 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 team come back from the deficit they did and actually win in really dominant fashion? Locked in all the time is very generous of you. I appreciate <laughs> that. I definitely don't feel that way. <laughs> but yeah, hello to you and everyone listening and watching. Um, appreciate everyone's support. Uh, like Dave just said before, but yeah, I um I actually missed the first quarter, mm-hmm. um, but then tuned in for the the three quarters after that, and yeah, it was really enjoyable from that point on. I tuned in at the precise moment I should have. Um, you were the secret that, source, oh, as we've talked about. Yeah, before. <laughs> yeah, but also you know just doing some odd jobs around the kitchen. The, heating up dinner, probably stacking or unstacking a dishwasher, all the same while having it on my phone on the kitchen bench and whatnot. Mm. But, yeah, just really got into it. Obviously, this team is on an upward trajectory and being a passionate football and Port Adelaide fan, I found myself cheering. I found like audibly cheering, audibly disappointed with facets of the game. Um, but all in all, uh, I came in at quarter time and while the score – looked concerning on one hand with the women's game i kind of thought back to our game against Fremantle and just thought oh well i haven't tuned in yet you know maybe there's a couple of goal breeze going to one one end and we'll Mm. see how the first half as a whole rolls out you know although yeah with kind of some of the football that we've played recently maybe thinking that we'd left a little bit to be desired in the first quarter and upon reflection and watching the whole game and then watching it back, it did seem that way. And Lauren Arnell mentioned the same thing in her press conference. So, uh, yeah, but as as a whole, like uh, I've watched, uh, like I said to you pre-recording, I've, I've watched it live for those three quarters. I've watched 
the second half back. I've watched the first half back. I've watched an amalgamation of several quarters together. And yeah, just um, the kind of team synergy that we're building at the moment. And obviously the, the wins that are coming off the back of it is really quite enjoyable. Mm. Uh, and I find myself wanting to go back and watch it again uh, further than to, yeah, do a little bit of research for, for this podcast, just for the pure enjoyment of it. And just seeing some of these players improve in real time. Um, I was thinking about it uh, over the last few days and, I think what the AFLW uh, enables you or how it encapsulates you is a bit similar to, I, I think you would be able to say from a college sport perspective in America, the people uh, watching feel a bit more connected because college sport athlete, like college athletes are a bit more real world and raw. They're not mm -hmm. earning the the massive paychecks that the professional athletes in, in America from that perspective are. And, and when we draw it back to AFL, we love our men's game. It's the elite of the sport um, and the, the skills, the pace, everything about the men's side of the game is fantastic. But they're now, yeah, they're upper echelon in terms of the way of life they live. And I think that's a bit of, where I'm finding, uh, I think where a lot of people are finding enjoyment with the AFLW at the moment is they're a bit more relatable, <clears throat> excuse me, relatable. And mm -hmm. then, so you can kind of invest in them a bit, um, a bit more emotionally, I, I guess. And, and yeah. And then on top of that, the improvement and some of the, some of the aspects of our game at the moment, just make it all that more enjoyable. Yeah. Yeah. And no, I was interesting. Uh I love you bringing up college sports because it just gives me an excuse to talk about it for a second. Um, <laughs> yeah, I went to college when yeah, there was a few just um, I went to Oregon for those unaware already. And there was a few guys that would walk into class and they'd have the athlete because they always got cool backpacks and swag bags and stuff like that. And then um, anyone that's an NFL fan will know this name, Marcus Mariota, um, who was the quarterback for Oregon 2012 through 2014, won the Heisman, which is the Brownlee medal for all of college football in 2014 i lined up to for him uh behind him for coffee a couple of times in college like uh, that's just a relatability yeah, yeah. even though yeah. he then went on to even even though he's been a backup for the last six years he's went on to earn millions just doing that but yeah there's a relatability to it in the fact that they're uh yeah it's just yeah they, they don't get they have to really work hard for what they do like their passion is yeah, it's kind of like college. You're working for your passion is what college is. And where AFLW is, is still at a point where you have to really work hard to earn your passion. And you see that that is this, the ethos of this Port Adelaide side we're watching right now is just so many, so many ladies, just the lady pair as a whole are working so, so hard for each other. And I love it. Watching them in mean, the first quarter was, again, there's a little bit of a slow start thing that we've talked about from probably three of the last four weeks. Um Mm -hmm. the Carlton game maybe aside, but even then there was a little bit of that in that because Carlton did get out to a seven-point lead before he uh, got on top of them. But That's true. Um, I guess if I'm going to ask for anything, in because AF AFLW is interesting because, because of the way scoring works, it, it, it is, you know, you're not going to get 20-goal games in AFLW yet at this point. Like, that's just where the league is at. You know, the, there's yeah. still records being broken when the teams get to certain scores. And so we're not... A slow start, as frustrating as frustrating as it is, isn't as much of a downturn in AFL. So if we can build into a game, and and again, I think we talked about it last week, Lauren Arnell was coaching and how she changed because first quarter this week, and and I I think I remember last week when we were just doing a brief preview on um, going into this week, I said there was a West Coast player, can't remember her name, but there's one that... To yeah, watch. we know it now. <laughs> yeah, it was, Ella, it was Ella Roberts. I remember her name coming up and I just couldn't remember. But yeah, that, that first quarter, she was marking everything. I think she took fucking four contested marks in the first quarter. But again, a testament to what we talked about last week, Lauren and I was coaching and just the coaching group as a whole, uh, everyone involved. The fact that we, we, we just switched at quarter time, worked out a way to like null nullify Ella's, Ella Roberts, who's again, a great player. Her influence in the second quarter was pretty much null and void. And then she got a little bit of run, a few marks in the second, the third and fourth quarter, but she'd never had yeah. 
that first quarter was like the Ella Roberts quarter, and then after that, she didn't get, have too much after that. And it, that's just that says to me so much about the ethos of what this Port Adelaide women's team is doing. And I was coaching, but then how that message is being translated because there are so many more players. Like, I mean, we've we've talked about Ebony Ebony O'Day for a couple of years. She had a great game. Um, you know, your Ange Foley's the vet, veterans that are in there, uh, but. It's the ones that are, it's the ones that we're really really highlighting a lot this year in our votes and whatever else it's your Cheyenne Hammonds it's your Maria Maloney's um, it's your fucking you know Caitlin Wendland scoring two goals she's a injury replacement player this year Tegan Germack again um, did I fuck that up again yeah yeah <laughs> so Germack is, God damn it anyway um, <laughs> she 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 had some impacts in this game but despite her stats being quite absolutely low, if you're, if yeah. you're looking at your sheet she had some real impacts in this game it's just there's this team ethos thing that i love about this port Adelaide side and um this game really epitomized it how they responded after quarter time for me yeah we definitely got a bit of a rocker and it was it was noted in the commentary that our pressure definitely list, lifted mm. we didn't afford them anywhere near as much spa- uh, space uh, but what I thought was interesting, uh, just with, again, talent pathways and where AFLW sits uh, in relation to the yeah veterans versus some of the new women coming into the sides, is mm-hmm. in, in the first quarter, we put Hammond on Roberts to do a job. Uh, and then, obviously, it didn't work. That's okay. I, I thought Hammond had a good game as a whole, though, yeah. uh, to be fair. Um but she had an incredible Lauren Arnell. Chase, down, chase down at one point. Absolutely. It's definitely I in wish my notes. I, um, yeah. yeah you I, were like, could we do a Sweeney? <laughs> exactly my thought. I was like, fuck. Cause <laughs> yeah, yeah. The I know. reason, I know. And, and just for the listeners, the reason I didn't bring in goal of the year and uh, goal of the week and Sweeney's is because sometimes you do get a game like the Kangaroos game where it's basically one way traffic. I didn't want to, yeah. I wasn't sure I wanted to do that kind of segment thing. Um, I think it's man- fair, yeah. Yeah, we the, still talk the man- about the, the, things the, like that. yeah, exactly. But if we we're going to nominate a Sweeney, oh, well, I think just that Cheyenne Hammond, that was one of the best chase downs I've seen in any footy game this year. And I've watched a lot of footy men's and women's this year. Yeah. Um, and the fact yeah, that she, she stuck to task. Um, yeah, and she the whole got, way and, and impacted the gut, kick. Gut busted no more than anyone <laughs> I've seen, and grabbed just jersey. It wasn't even she grabbed around the body because often you see AFL men's players grab jersey. Oh, Guernsey, sorry, American parlance, but um, and often just slip out of it. She grabbed and just fucking held on. So I, I there's exactly, a few jumper grabs in the women's yeah. game. Um, yeah, which is great. It, it, yeah, yeah, it means they're just they're um, <laughs> yeah, at the final inch, they're still just trying to grab on um yeah. and not give up on the contest. But to go yeah. back to the back to um, your point, what sorry, I was saying I, I was uh, <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> um, we're the tangent podcast here, especially after a win. But um, uh, we made the move to put Goody on Roberts. Mm-hmm. So Lauren Arnell uh, has gone take a kind of senior player off and put a young professional on to match because Ella Roberts is 19 years old uh, mm-hmm. as well. So it's just that it's – and Lauren Arnell made note of the fact that while all the stalwarts and the um, kind of elder – states women uh, of the competition they didn't have talent pathways to come through the young ones coming through now have had that talent pathway available to them so they actually come in quite professional and and act Mm. accordingly in in that regard um so i thought it was really interesting because goody then like you said held her to one disposal in the second quarter now i don't know what happened after half time exactly but i thought it was just interesting where Ella Roberts has obviously come through a talent pathway in Western Australia and she's hitting the ground running. I mean, she mm-hmm. put it all on display in the first quarter. So we went, this is a time where we change tack and go, the senior player isn't quite getting it done. We'll go the young professional who can kind of match this player, Ella Roberts, for age, but also professionalism, mm-hmm. um, just where the cup compartmentalization of where players are coming from and like what their background is coming into the AFLW. I thought that was really interesting and, and just a signal of things to come. Um, and just as we go through the years, just more and more of these ready-made AFLW players are going to come in and make an impact, whatever job that they're given. Um, 
So I thought that was a nod for talent pathways and youth professionalism coming through. And, and I mean, we're benefiting from it for sure in other aspects too. Yeah. I think that's a really good uh, point just to bring up for the fans too, because there are some fans out there that just look at AFLW and just expect everyone to be on the same spectrum because we're used to AFL men's who have been a professional league for even if you, you know, you can argue where AFL men's became truly professional. It's still been a highly developed league for, you know, tens of, yeah. you know, decades and decades and decades. Even if you say 2000, the year 2000, yeah. um, it's yeah, still... But- Nearly twenty five years. Look at, look at the way Gavin Wanganin came in in the early nineties, like guys like that. Like, yeah. there's there was clearly and Russell Ebert was, yeah, lauded, Andrew lauded. McLeod, yeah, and but Russell Ebert was lauded as a player um, beyond his years as far as his professionalism yeah. went in those you know seventies and eight and eighties. So, yeah, the point you bring up about the players that the senior players, you know, whether it be your you know, your Ange Foley's and all that, they're still incredible players, but. These ones that you can just see it in the way the confidence and the and the power of like Shanae Goody's kicks when she grabs the ball, mm-hmm. whether it's her run or just her accelerating mm-hmm. acceleration when she runs, or her her kicking ability. It's just there is this there is a lot of generations of players and their professionalism within the AFLW game, and it's really important for fans to note that that when you watch a player, sometimes you you've got to we're gonna. It's gonna take a decade or two before we get to a point where everyone is of the similar ability. Yeah. As far as they're, they're mm. you know, you're gonna have players that have experience, but they don't have the ability that, you know, Ange. Well, that just to... intrinsic. Yeah. Nature uh, uh, about them. It. Yeah. Because mm. Ange Foley twenty years ago didn't even know there was gonna be a league. Shanae Goody's. That's right. Almost, you know, Shanae Goody's eighteen, and she's known a league almost half of her life. There is a big difference between well yeah that. when you look at our last couple of drafts like they're all playing first 22 football yeah um like uh yeah i mean all of our draftees are from th- for this season are all playing yeah and that's... injury replacements <laughs> but yeah <laughs> um that's what, i mean that's why i've always said that aaron, aaron phillips deserves credit as one of the greatest athletes of all time because she's won wnba wnba championships and then come over and then immediately being one of the best players immediately in the league, yep. like far and beyond what everyone else is doing. So yeah, it's a good point to bring up just to, just to, for everyone that's watching, um, give just before you criticize in an AFL men's sense, just make sure you understand the journey that each players come from, because we are in a still building, building phase of the league as a whole. Certainly good to be constructively critical. I think what I've seen from a lot of the good AFLW journalists out there is like, understand where each player and each team is coming from and the journey they've been on and, and where they are now. And then, you know, you can't just say, oh, they're shit because they they missed this kick or whatever. You've got to understand, like, you know, and whatever team, whatever team's journey is or whatever. Um, you know, it's a good, it's just a I good think that, uh, I think yeah. that even, yeah, I don't know. I'm probably, uh, yeah, romanticizing the game a little bit because we're winning and we, and we won but like even even some of Romance those raw like, el- elements I'm a romanticized but, sports at all times if yeah. you can so go but I, like I, it just reminds yeah. me of like going to watch like Teacher Gully A grade at mm. Perderinga Oval and you know that's that's div 1 div 2 f- amateur football and it's still a pretty good bloody standard but there's still you know hack kicks and turnovers and just that just that raw essence of Australian rules football that is mm. still being encapsulated and sure yeah this is the professional competition for women in our country in, in for Australian rules football and you know the disposal efficiency could be bigger like some aspect uh, some aspects could be better but I don't know I'm just enjoying some of that raw those raw elements of the AFL, like I, I said before in my opening, um, just to see how they react in real time. Um, it's not perfect, but life isn't perfect. And, um, and, and yeah, uh, just c- comparing it to where we were at the start of the season, even and last year and the year before, um, yeah. I- I'm finding enjoyment in some of the, the low lights as much as, I am in the uh, the highlights, but for different reasons. 
Yeah, yeah, no, same. It's the thing is like we there's a lot of like you know, the hack where, where kick goes you know forward out of midfield and it gets gets hacked a bit higher and and whatnot. But you you get that in the men's and then again just got, like tailing back to the start of the conversation on this kind of stuff that we're talking about. The shy and Hammond chase down tackle is one of the best I've seen in AFL men's or so. That's kind of the stuff that I love. Like, is that you see some stuff that you just go, "This is the future of the league right here," and it's just, I, lo- I love that stuff. Um, yeah, absolutely. The pre- yeah, the pressure, and, and it is. It's really interesting. I'm just scrolling down to the stats for the game because, again, we didn't have as much of the ball overall. Um, mm-hmm. We didn't, uh, but it was really our pressure. Like, and the commentators, um, and it was. Uh, Adam Papali, I think, was what the lead commentator. We got treated to um, some we, Adam Papali commentary, which was yeah, nice. Which we got. What was the AFL men's game we got with him this year? Was that? Uh, we got the showdown. That was him. That um, was him did. on the showdown. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. I think he did one more. Um, he didn't do when we were. Over I think there. he did the Frio game over, Frio in Perth. We were over there. Yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah, yeah. The showdown. Yeah. Uh, was definitely one that I remember from him. Yeah. So we got I remember him posting on Twitter how excited he either was to do it or how excited uh, he he was to have done it, yeah. Um, yeah, which is great. Again, as someone from outside the state enjoying the showdown, I'm all for that. Um, but, yeah, that's just a digression. Um, yeah. We got treated to him in, in AFLW this week, which is great. Yeah, and he has a he has a really good handle on it. It seems as well, which I I, I highly respect. And, and it was mentioned a lot in the commentary commentary by him. And um, I think Bonnie Downer was one of the other ones. I can't remember the other names, so that's my my bad. But um, beyond the first quarter, like our pressure was really good. Tackling it was multiple times. Or that's what I really love is like we have progressed our game plan to be we move the ball quite quickly and and with purpose the last couple of weeks um actually the last three weeks i still go back to that richmond game and go apart from that first quarter we were pretty fucking good um mm. against richmond as well and our pressure our pressure on even though i mean just yeah a disposal a disposal disposal efficiency actually in the game if you look at the stats we're actually three percent less or two and a half percent less than west coast but because we had so much less of the ball like forty odd less possessions, it's kind of like even, but um, it's our inside fifties again. We just we have this punch the ball forward thing that we've been kind of yeah working yeah towards, exactly working towards that I really love. Um, it's still not perfect, obviously, but we're getting results enough now that we're now winning games. We almost again that slow start against Richmond aside, I think we could have won that game. Like as we were in that game for three quarters, we just gave them the first quarter and that was ultimately the uh the result but the last two games we've won the won the inside 50s won uh, you know and just played our game and won the games quite convincingly i think in the end and you can see a game plan mm-hmm. going forward and then when you throw the pressure in around the ball and everything yeah it's really really impressive yeah i i agree and what i found interesting <clears throat> was that we were Handily dominated in marks overall, uh, and contested contested marks. Um, We almost matched them for marks inside fifty, which I think is probably more important Mm. uh, in the women's game. Uh, 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 But it just showed that where the lack of marking has severely let us down in some recent games. Mm -hmm. It uh, just due to the nature of uh, a bit more open space. The weather was great, and we were we were marking it with decent regularity in this game. I thought, uh, but we yeah we focused on multiple things to generate scores moving forward, and and yeah, where where we're a bit of a surge team, it's not as chaotic as what we commented on a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, it it looks to be surged forward with a bit of a refined purpose whereas yeah the kangaroos game and the the richmond early doors it was just a bit shambolic um there wasn't a lot of looking up and scanning and like there was definitely parts of this game where it was your get out kick being performed and that's nothing new to australian rules football 
But yeah, when we found the ball in space, we were looking to link up a bit better and we were looking to surge it into more advantageous positions on the field. Uh, and then we let our better players go to work. I think that's I think that's what's turned around mostly is we're getting our better players involved in the game because um, there is definitely a differentiation of skill uh, between the top end and the bottom end. And I think we're, we're better uh equipped with our better players around the ball and and it, it's showing uh again you mentioned litmus test in the uh the preview the slight preview we did for this game and then in your yeah. opener uh, yeah west coast are now what a position above us on the ladder um so to go to go the journey with someone there and thereabouts with us and like you said the score flattered them i thought that in immediately after and then when i watched the replay i I thought so and i actually had a note here to say that in the first quarter they did score score three goals one but i thought a couple of them were too unlucky it was free kicks in two of them wasn't there yeah so that ebony ellen roberts was that yeah yeah like that's not holding the ball in the men's game so i don't yeah well (laughs) that's exactly right um (laughs) the first possession would have been but yeah. we've seen it. We've seen it all year that if you release that first possession, you stand up, mm-hmm. and then you go back for a second and get tackled. That's a ball up, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, mm. But not only that is, I don't think that Ella Roberts pushing the back was very no egregious in the back. Uh, when watching it live, it looked equal parts in the side, enough in in the side. Sh- of her body, should I say, to just kind of let let it go. Um, again, Cheyenne Hammond not giving up uh, on the contest mm-hmm. in that regard. But, yeah, then it ended up in a downfield free in the goal square. So That whole situation was really weird too. The commentators didn't even understand what was going on there for a moment. They yeah. Like, Ella Roberts yeah. has gained herself some position and then, oh, no, it's Well, they pulled it downfield, but I thought it was very much in the action of the kick that yeah. she got pushed wherever she got pushed. I think it was enough in the side to warrant a play on call, but mm. yeah, um, it was just a really odd moment. And then, yeah, when you consider, I, I have another note here to say that the home crew was, was the home side manning the three quarter time siren. Cause it, <laughs> in that last play in the third quarter, it looked, just seemed like someone was like, Oh, oh there's yeah. a mark. Now the siren can go. <laughs> so yeah um look i'm sure we probably benefited from some maybe some so-so decisions or something like that i can't really remember and the i thought we did a lot the, of great work the free kick count favored us quite substantially but as far as like as you just brought up like some of the major ones you think of well not the the three-quarter time ones a free kick but yeah it just feels like they got the rub of the green either in free kicks or in, um in front or, of goal or just, i think or just, or just moments uh, at the right time and we were able yeah, to, yeah. and we were able to kind of, you know, assuage that. Yeah, I mean, I love that the fact that we came out in, at the start of the fourth quarter. I think it was was it Houghton's second goal that she kicked, like you know, within a minute. Like after they'd, you know, that they have the there's a momentum thing that comes with kicking a, a goal on the third quarter siren to get within eight nine points or whatever it was, and then Houghton just comes out within a minute and just bangs one through, and it's just like, yeah, no, let, let's go, game done. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and then we backed it up again with another. Yeah, um, I think it yeah. was Wen- Wenland that kicked the next one. And, um, and again, shout out to her because she she was clutching the couple of couple of shots that she had because you need to be in a in a you know low scoring game that the AFLW gen- generally is more more so low low scoring in the sense of if you want to compare it to men's, it's um it's a decent scoring game, but um yeah, yeah and that's just- it probably puts more of a focus on some of those free kicks in front of goal because yes it does yeah it's like it's like in in the premier league if a ref's just deciding to go that's penalty that's penalty you know yeah. like you like goals don't come that easily like yeah. you can't just be giving shots away like that but um yeah it's like it's kind of like it's, maybe ice hockey would be a good pal because you know ice hockey is a little bit more high, high scoring but yeah you give give a penalty in ice hockey you yeah it's like yeah, it's a pretty, it's a pretty on. high. We got to get that back now. <laughs> pretty high bar to like to give that away. So um, yeah, it's a, 
Yeah, but the fact we fought fought against those forces in an away game, I think, is really just quite good. Uh, we haven't even touched on um, Juzzy's two minutes of magic, by the way. <laughs> just you want to talk about that for a second? Oh, I mean, it's it's one of one of my notes for sure. She just yeah. popped up and impacted exactly when she needed to. Yeah, it was fantastic. Based off pressure, and just before we touch on that, you mentioned yeah, yeah. we won the free kick count, and we won it quite handily, mm. but we also won the tackle count and tackles yes. inside 50 on that note. And I think I they kind of coincided. Plus 20-odd? Yeah, plus 19, yeah, and tackles, yeah, yeah. And that's, yeah. I think that comes with it, is like a lot of those free kicks came from pressure. So that's where, yeah. it, you know, some fans that look at free kick counts don't like it. Man, you and I will criticize umpiring in the you know we've done it a couple of times in the men's season but we'll never do it based on count we'll do it based on decisions we've seen at times right like we never i think that hawthorne semi-final was a good example because they actually we actually got to know that we won five free kicks from holding the ball which again is an indicator of pressure and tackling and whatnot um Whereas, yeah, if you're not handed that information, you're like, oh, geez, Porter getting a good run here in that first quarter yeah. um, of the semi final. But yeah, exactly what you were saying. Yeah, you don't know sometimes yeah. how deserved they are or yeah, not. Yeah, binary numbers are just like you can do whatever you want with them, but you need context for them. Yeah. It's like, mm-hmm. as the entire thing I was taught doing a history degree is like you can be given the names, the numbers, and the how many people die, but you need to know the why. <laughs> like, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. But, and- yeah, um, yeah, Jersey, yeah. Uh, rightfully lauded in her performance um, by Lauren Arnell just mm. for how team first she is. And i, I got to admit, like, I, I don't really know that. Um, there's maybe not as many telltale signs to to me or the layman mm. uh, in regards to that, and but she's put together 75 games of AFLW football and well respected by both her clubs that she's represented. Mm. Um, so yeah, I was obviously overjoyed by how quickly she impacted the scoreboard. It definitely just hammered home our ascendancy. And what mm. was it? Was it her two goals? made that's it a bro- five goal run that, for us which yeah. is that's what broke it open like that, awesome yeah. yeah um yeah i mean her her both her goals are really like she she's on the, the one of the boundaries she kind of calls for it like she's it's it's like she's been involved in the contest and she calls for it to come back to her and she snaps it and then the second one like a minute later in gameplay, it's about two minutes later in real time. But like it's Ella Bogue um, in the co- like Juzzy goes up for the mark and kind of goes over her top. Um, and great work from Ella. That would have been a nice mark, wouldn't it? It would have been. It would have been <laughs> if yeah, she yeah. took it. It was nice inside. <laughs> yeah, because it was really, really like over the top. Like would have been a good highlight extension. But, yeah. yeah, but um, shout out to Ella Bogue who is. I mean, shout out to both of them actually because Juzzy kind of hangs back and Ella Bogues in the contest taps it, just taps it along the ground like it doesn't. Yeah, she went on. to grab it and then she's like, "Oh no!" Yeah, yeah. she sees she's on. Like it's, it's clearly not like just a tap because mm. AFL footy, you know, we know it moves so fast. Sometimes you just you do just tap in hope, but it's clearly Ella going tapping because she knows Juzzy's there, and then you know uh, Juzzy picks it up. And um, shout out to you by the way, putting out on Twitter because I think both the AFL women's account and possibly the commentators referred to her as just Justine Mules rather than Justine Mules Robinson. <laughs> yeah, um, yeah. She is just really Mules. strange by the official account on Twitter. It is because she was kind of let themselves clearly, down there. She quite clearly got married in the off season that was celebrated by multiple accounts, both poor and I assume the air film. <laughs> so yeah, no, it's it's not like it's a secret news that um uh, Justine Mules and got she's married. Listed on literally the AFL website. website and yeah it's just right there. Um yeah 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 no yeah. just tra- train you and not that it's it's hard doing like doing social media or whatever but yeah just make sure your people are trained a little bit better because um <laughs> she deserves to like she's clearly gotten married uh to someone she loves dearly and uh has taken the hyphenated name so just it's quite simple mm. especially in her yeah. 70 especially well port adelaide it's, is it's blessed either... with a lot of hyphenates across yeah. the club <laughs> <laughs> exactly yeah yeah team hyphen um so yeah <laughs> but especially in her 75th game of all games just fucking get it right yeah, and, yeah and, like and, she's and, the focus here <laughs> yeah and some people might be going 75th game what are we talking about 
Um, anyone that's again listening to the podcast, I want to, you know, encourage just to get around the women's game a little bit more. Um, because the women only play, you know, ten or so games a year. Seventy-five games in a career at the moment in the women's game is quite a significant achievement. Justine's well, it's seven know, years. It's basically one hundred and twenty yeah. to one hundred and forty men's games. Well, if we look at it going, depending, you know, men, injury or or whatever considered. Well, men have men have one hundred fifty to play twenty-two a year if they fit. So then mm. them only having eleven now. Um, it's actually close to 160, 165, 70. Like if you want to do, <laughs> we want to really get into the math, which I'm not going to fucking do, but it's at least 150 is what she's just celebrated. So um, a shout out to Justine um, Mules Robinson uh, for that achievement and for having an all-timer of a game in the impact of it because two goals in two minutes of gameplay uh, or two min- less than two minutes of gameplay really. Um, yeah. Two really nice yeah. goals too. Like one snap from the boundary, another one just snapped from contest in front uh, from about 35 out or whatever it was. Um, mm. at a crucial time in the game. It's not like we're just it's not like it's, you know, you're fucking 40 points up and snapping a couple through just because you know Yeah, a bit of party time stuff. It was it was she was the game breaker in the game, which was really, really cool for her to be that. And then and then we just hold on to it for towards the end, which again I think comes down to both um I love that she's the game breaker and then it's a mixture of Arnell's coaching and, and the switching of the magnets, as you talked about with like Sinead Goody and, and like just moving people around onto, onto Roberts and just kind of curtailing that influence of their best player. And then um, really, really, really enjoyed that fourth quarter. I know we got the two goals quick and then it felt like, because once like watching the replay, because I knew what the final score was in my head. I knew that we finally you know, watching the replay, I know our final score is 7-7. We get up to seven goals early in the fourth quarter. I'm like, okay, how is this going to play out now watching the replay? And it's just, we just held the zone. We held the zone mm-hmm. defense. We we had the ball more or less in our half. And uh, that pressure just told whenever they tried to get out, our pressure was good. It was just a really good, um, yeah. uh, totally zone um I defense. think that's another thing forward, that we're doing forward well. Defense. Yes, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I think we're setting up better behind the ball yes. as well in the last couple of games in particular. Uh, so, yeah, because we spent a lot of time in our forward half across the four quarters. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, yeah, something that we were commenting on the on the negative is how many times, uh, like versus Richmond, uh, was how many times we were giving it back to them for them to just re-enter the ball. And yeah, in large portions of this game, we looked in much better shape in that regard to do that exact thing to yeah. uh, the West Coast Eagles, uh, which again is another thing. Like they're just building blocks, and we're just putting certain ones in place at the moment. In in obviously to strive for perfection, um, and I guess it's noted like Lauren Arnell has spoken many times now about their off-season goal to get fit and it's yeah it's clearly paying dividends we're finishing games really really well which would give them confidence in real time you know first quarter three goals down or even if the game's neck and neck or even if we're slightly behind at three quarter time we'd still have the confidence that we can run out the game well and i remember the first season in particular uh, the the hype was about us playing Port Adelaide brand football, and which we still do. It's mm. highly contested, high tackle numbers, but both of those are very taxing. And in the first season in particular, we're just losing a bit of puff, and so now we're we're seeing an extension of our contested game on top of the increased fitness in our ability to finish games out and get better looks at it. Uh, So, and, and we've already with this win, we're now confirmed. It's now confirmed our best season of AFLW already um, uh, with us knocking on the door of, of the top eight. Uh, So a huge credit goes to them for the work that they did in the off season and how it is all marrying up now with, yeah, a handful of really winnable games to come. Yeah, yeah, and we'll get to talking about um, this Thursday night um, towards the end of the podcast. But yeah, it's um, it's a really good point you bring up about just 
you know, evolution and development of game plan because that was kind of the core of what we started with was I now was like, I'm going to come in and just put down this line in the sand of just, this is the kind of brand of footy we're going to play. But then as you develop, you've got to develop kind of a game plan within that. And that you can see that really building now. And, it, you know, there has been frustrations, you know, last year it was just like, Oh, you know, the, the second year really didn't really improve much on it, but we're still so focused on youthful development. I mean, that's, it's still very much a youthful team. Mm -hmm. so there's so much room i mean again like i could look at this game like watching the replay i can't i didn't have i didn't take too many notes because i was watching it um in between things so i i wish i could take it and, and it's a game i really would have loved to have taken more detailed notes because there's moments where i was like yeah, there's a drop mark there's so there's still moments you can be constructively critical of the team and their just individual skills in moments or whatever but overall as far as game plan as far as application to the game plan there's so much to love about what they're doing and they've just won two in a row against, um, you know, West Coast side over and West Coast, that Carlton team. Um, both teams, but, you know, they're not terrible teams. Um, well, Carlton were above us when we played yeah. them. So. And, then, and, and Frio, <laughs> who are right up there as well at the moment still, um, we kind of looked like we could have beaten them up to the last Oh, we, yeah. So mm -hmm. Let it slip um, a little bit. Richmond, again, the team in the top eight, a team that we, for two and a half quarters, I think, at least matched or bested. Uh, and then the Crows uh, in week one, I think we had a fairly good crack against them. So you can kind of see, mm. yeah, there's there's mo moments, individual moments of improvement that can definitely come and, you know, who knows. You know. But we're at, a, we're at a point now that we can we can look forward and go, we're in a position ha over halfway through the season now that we can look and at least dream of, touching finals so that's a that's, yeah absolutely oh, that's, 100%. What we, that's what we wanted yeah. this year and and we've already bested out then and we we wanted to best our best effort as far as win win totals go we should be looking towards that we've done that now we've got four weeks to go um and and yeah that that's all in front of us as far as this game goes though uh i'm trying to think if i have any other notes in particular on how it went i'm just yeah i'm just really impressed with the just the overall pressure that was um Lots of individual performances to talk about. I know there's a few that will come up in the votes. I'm trying to, I'm just mm -hmm. trying not to, I'm trying to hold back a little bit on a couple of people. <laughs> um, but, you know, the likes of Caitlin Wedland and uh, um, again, I'll, I'll bring up, uh, you know, Gemma Houghton again. Just uh, she's, she's got a little bit of barometer about her. Um, love when mm. she goes, yeah. Once, you, yeah. once you start throwing. Just get her into the game. Yeah. And that's what, that's what Put sucks the about the fear that. of God into the opposition. <laughs> love that yeah that's what sucks about the first quarter is like you know you just know that if, if get her involved early but um you know whether that's just how the game's going but you know once she once she gets going it's just when mm. she's in that form i mean she's kicked that's three weeks in a row now i think she's kicked two goals in the game and with two out of three wins in those games and that again that richmond one was one that when she came into the game it became an even game so you know once she's kicking two goals in a game you can kind of sit there and say we're probably in it. We're probably in the game if she's kicking at least mm -hmm. two and having that kind of impact. Um, incredible from her. Um, Ashley Saint continue continues to kind of play that role as well. Like that, that we're we're starting to work with our athletic forwards really, really well now. Um, it's almost you know Julia Tickle, as much as I love her over those last few, first few weeks. She she's almost ridiculously, and I say this with the utmost respect, an afterthought in those three, <laughs> like because. Mm. So those two, like Saints, been throwing herself around. Houghton's obviously kicking the two goals and and doing some of that. Like Houghton's kind of yeah. Like, Houghton reminds me of like what everyone wants Jake Stringer to be, or what they think Jake Stringer is. In their mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like that one that's up yeah. the field. Like Jimmy Houghton is actually Jake Stringer without the problems. Um, <laughs> yeah. Without the attitude and and without the fact that he, you know Jake contract Stringer or whatever. Jimmy Houghton's just that all the time. Um, Mm. And yeah, Ashley Saints, the way she's playing is just. Yeah. I think yeah, I um I have Ashley Saint as one of my honourable mentions because I think to yeah. further on your point just then, uh, I think that she's kind of sacrificed a little part of her game for the Absolutely. benefit of the team. Yeah. Uh, now I think she went goalless in this game. Did no, she? she had one. She had one. Uh, she got the one goal. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, which is credit to her teamwork, uh, like her team first uh, play, because uh, yeah, she's being utilised further up the field, like we spoke about last couple of games, 
uh, she's a very skillful footballer and yeah. she's she's getting herself around the midfield a lot more. She's playing a higher forward role in parts and creating a bit of a link up and a bit of a more assured presence around the football, a bit of a cleaner. Like Maloney and uh, Dowrick are the a bit more of your grunt, although Derek can use the ball very well in her own right. Oh, my gosh. Uh, Ash Saint is adding a, a layer of silk to it all, uh, if you will. And um, while I say that, her disp disposal efficiency as a whole <laughs> is quite low uh, in comparison to those guys. Uh, I just feel that the vibe around the football is much, much better when she's there. And I feel, this is just a guess, but I would imagine her overall knowledge of the game and just being that little more experienced. She's kind of in that mid pack between that real youth and that veteran status. Mm -hmm. She would be um, directing a bit of traffic, I feel. And yeah, I, I, I wanted to give her votes, but um, so when I could, when I couldn't, I definitely wanted to highlight her because I do feel that she is sacrificing the, you know, all Australian forward, nature of her game to better impact as a whole for our team yeah yeah no i absolutely agree she's um i think that's again what i've talked about with like arnell's coaching and stuff like what what they're doing with their athletic big tall forwards because we one of our major detractions of our first couple of seasons was our size right like i remember you and i talking at yeah that first home game that we went to the first home game at albert and we were talking about, geez, we're fucking small. Like, that's going to be a major impact. Yeah, we got it's marked gonna... against a lot. Yeah. It, and it was simply just, you didn't even have to try. It was just like, just mark up, like, just man up and mm, we'll, put we'll it in the air. Us. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> and you're just going to stand above. And, but so you can see as we've, we've developed the side a little bit to get a bit taller, but you can see we're starting to use some of these tall players around the field, like, a little bit more to kind of just mm. to, like, to you know nullify that impact and not that we're yeah we're a lot bigger as a side generally now anyway but yeah it's yeah it's creative it's create it's creative magnet switching as well to be able to utilize those players up the field and um yeah Gemma and Ashley um run, getting up the field more than anything and then and then making that impact felt in the forward line as well um mm. yeah did you have anything else before we get to votes because I really want to talk about some players <laughs> Uh, look, no, nothing really. Yeah, we'll probably cross over into players we're going to talk about anyway if we if we keep running through it all. Uh, yeah. So yeah, let's uh, let's get going. All right, cool. I'm going first on votes this week, and I wanted to <clears> just do one particularly honor honorable mention because um, I probably should have got into, into my votes to be honest. Um, but because I'm just looking at it again, I'm just like, fuck. Um, Ange Foley, um, we've talked about her a bit as a veteran presence um, on this episode, um, just naturally. But uh, yeah, just the more I look at her, so like she 11 disposal at 90%, 470 meters gained, which you, when you look at, yeah, I fucking should have got her into my voice, to be honest. Anyway. Uh, well, I didn't, <laughs> if it makes you feel any better. <laughs> uh, no, so I just like, I just love that, you know, her, her veteran presence is so important to the side anyway, but having 11 disposals at 90% and 470 metres gained in those 11 disposals is fucking pretty amazing. Um, and she's just, uh, and taking three marks in there as well. Um, just, I, I, I try to get her in there and just, but um, the reason, she probably would have gotten into my one vote. The one I have in my one vote is, we've talked about it already, uh, Jazzy, uh, Jazzy Mills Robinson. Uh, two incredible goals and, and goals, we talked about in the men's game a lot. I I just make up reasons for why things matter. I think when you kick two <laughs> goals in two minutes at a time when it breaks the game open, that's that's cl that's a little clutch mm. point clutch point for me. Um, and overall, I just think she, her leadership out there, and obviously she's taken over the um, leadership of the team as captain from um, Janelle Cuthbertson because of the injury to the, the ACL injury. She went at fifty percent, um, had the eight disposals. Not like a great game on the stat sheet or anything, but I think those two goals, especially in the women's game, two goals at a clutch moment like that is huge to me. Um, and she deserves a one vote, especially in her 75th game. Got to, When you have a performance like that in a milestone game, as we said, if you want to extrapolate it out to men's games, you're talking about a woman that's playing a 
one fiftieth at least. So mm. what she's what she's meant to the women's game um, in its development and her being able to put on that performance, uh, what is a game breaking performance? Uh, if if you don't don't want to call it game winning, quite uh, it's it's quite incredible. So, if you will, yes. Uh, so one vote to her. <laughs> Uh, I've given two votes to Molly Brooksby, who, fuck, she's quickly becoming one of my favourite. <laughs> There's plenty of favourites <laughs> in this side, but um, 15 to Yeah, I just recently learned she's a Northeastern girl. Um, so oh, yeah? Definitely went up a couple pegs in my book, yeah, being yeah. a Northeastern uh, <laughs> local. Shout out to Tree Plaza. Yeah, um, I believe Golden Grove Football Club, so shout out to them. Oh, nice. Uh, yeah. For Molly Brooksby, yeah. Has she done? Has she done Friday nights at the gully? Let's. I need to know that. Um, that doesn't exist anymore. Does it not? That shows how old I am. No, no, no. What do they do? No. At the, what, what, are, what do they do at Friday nights at the gully now? Do they, well, do... people still probably go for meals and and whatnot, but it does not. Uh, it definitely oh. does not get converted to a nightclub like it did when, yeah, when I became an adult <laughs> in the local area. Uh, some very fond memories at the gully. Oh, I'm oh, sure. Same. Yeah, there's other people out there. <laughs> Same here. Same. Yeah. This podcast has just aged itself. Anyway, so Molly Brooksby. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on. Anyway, uh, loved her game. Like, she's she continues to... She's one of those ones, as you were talking about earlier, about pathways and stuff. Like, she, you can just see that, like, her confidence in how she runs and goes. There was one more... At one point, there was a... Passage hand, of play. Handball chain where she's getting tackled. And she's yes. just like... She's still just like... Oh, oh, someone's got their hand on my jumper. No fucking worries. I I'll think, just, yeah. I was just yeah. fucking handball to someone. Like, I'm good. Like, we're good. She seemed in control of her space. Yes. And something I meant to bring up before when we were talking about Sinead Goody, and, and again, it, it's probably just this talent pathway, you know, that football is now an intrinsic part of their life. Sinead Goody, when she gets the ball, she's scanning the field. And Molly Brooksby, particularly in that moment, but generally when she gets possession of the football, they're scanning the field, which is a telltale sign of someone with a decent footy IQ. I mean, again, AFL men's game, nearly everyone. Like, it's just you get the ball, you're looking around, and we lord Zach Butters because he kind of does it, a, you know, yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. like a few steps ahead before yeah. he's got the ball, when he's got the ball. And, yeah, just – and I think that's that's something that I've noticed with those – two in particular, and as a result, they're, they're fresh faces on the scene, scanning the field, just looking for best options. And, yeah, yeah that passage of play that you're talking about, again, that could have probably made the Sweeney list if we were doing it, um, for sure. Yeah, there was a fair few. We might have to – yeah, we're going to have to do that for next year, I reckon, because these girls are going to give us plenty. Um, yeah, my three votes, I've got Maria Maloney, who's quietly just every week going about it. She's she's kind of – She'd be um, up there in the BNF. Yeah, I reckon, I reckon she will be. I, she, she's like a straw that stirs a drink kind of player. Like you can't. Mm-hmm. This this whole thing doesn't work with just the out the everything she's doing. And she went at eighty six percent in it with a disposal efficiency with fifteen disposals, which was the well equal equal second best on ground with two other players, including um, your your girl, which I'm sure we'll get to soon. <laughs> uh, and Mo- and Molly. Um, yeah, she had three thirty yeah. metres gained. Um, her contested possession numbers, I think, were pretty good as well. She um, had the eight contested possessions. It was fourth best on ground. Um, just her drive and her energy is just uh, like Mal- Maloney's been one of those players that she's been around for the last couple of years, but this year has been a real year that I'm just really, really seeing her so much more than I did before. Well, yeah. like, I've known of her for a long time now um, as yeah. a Port AFLW fan, but this year is like the year that now that we're playing just a – Starting to keep the uh, cohesive brand of footy is she's growing yeah. with she's one of those ones that's growing with the program, which I I, I fucking absolutely love. Mm. And um, it's been noted that she unfortunately was kind of playing second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth fiddle to a strong Brisbane outfit when she was up there. Yeah. Um, yeah. So now relishing in uh, would have been playing in the same team role. As- Lauren Arnell, right? Like the the one that was yeah, it's a, yeah, yeah. It'd be a interesting. It, yeah, the paths surely crossed um, yeah. up that way beforehand, but now she's one of yeah the head honchos in our midfield group, and yeah. she's relishing it clearly. Yeah, um, and and in a midfield group that is starting to become full of stars, including my four votes that goes to one 
Matilda, Jamie's favorite ever, uh, Schultz. <laughs> um, I think one of the my favorite games, just one of my favorite games I've seen her play, and she's played a fair few good ones already. She's dominated. Um, yeah, yeah, she she dominated us for like content. I think what what did she have? She had, I think she had every possession of hers was essentially um, contested. Uh, Correct. As a, which as a ruck woman, like you know that, that's part, but. She uh she had seven inside fifties. Um, she was um at five, uh, six clearances I think. Uh, five from stoppage. Mm -hmm. Um, and just overall, beyond that, just some of her power. Like, if this is going to be our woman, that's going to be our ruck woman for the next ten years. <laughs> fucking sign me the fuck up because some of those. Especially after women's, and as it develops over the next ten years, it'll be interesting to see how it goes. But we see it as such, it is such a more territory and possession game at the moment because if you get the center clearance and you get it down, because scoring is lower, if you can get it down in your forward half. That can be a big part of your building to a major score. And Tilds came in with some just massive smashes forward, just um, mm. just getting the getting the fist to it. Uh, just again, talking about her. And her game just makes me want to go back and watch it again now. Yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Jamie, I, I jump, have some words, but I'll let this... you get through your votes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, no, I won't, I won't spend too much more time on it because I'm sure... No, it'll... take the time you need. I'm enjoying <laughs> it. I'm sure the listeners are enjoying it. Um, But, yeah, no, I, I loved her game. Like, this is one of... Especially this year, we, we obviously started out with Showdown and she had a interesting game that wasn't helped by... She got humbled. Yeah, she got humbled, humbled by some umpiring decisions and just being on the wrong side of experience in those situations, I think. It's one of those situations where you were the young player in a, in a ruck contest and you just, you know, if you'd been a bit more experienced, you would have maybe handled it. It was like my minute percentages of touch and whatever in those moments. But she's grown since then. Obviously, last year, she had a great year, for great first year. And, Absolutely. Um, and she's learned from those things clearly already. And and and, the, and she's growing with the team. And she's obviously a great personality. I mean, we see the uh, little, like, interview, the, the little bits, the Port Adelaide socials. The, the Tilds talk. Tilds talks, yeah. Just wandering up <laughs> to people in the airport and just asking them questions. Like, she's a clear personality. She comes from a sporting family. Yeah. So there's a bit of, there's a bit of <laughs> that in there, too. But, um, yeah, she's... She's growing into just a, a menace of a player, and and, and Paps commentators were uh, were definitely talking about it a bit on the day too. Oh yeah, you can tell that the broader AFLW scene is very aware of the young talent that Matilda Schultz is. Yeah, yeah, they know that she's gonna being at what nineteen that she is now. In if she keeps growing at this pace and turns into the ruck woman that she looks like she will be. In three or four years, she's going to be just a monster in the competition, both in her ruck ability, but just her ability around the ground. Like she's just, um, yeah, she's still figuring it out. Like you see, sometimes when she's moving, she's like a like a giraffe that's just been born. Like there's there's moments that you still see that's just like okay, she's still, but just what she can do in raw ability, yeah, kind of makes up for that. And and then you just th sit there and think, well, once she gets rid of that because she's only nineteen, then the, the world's her, own. yeah. I was obviously going to save it for when I was listing my votes, but I might as well say it now because we're on the topic. But mm. uh, Port Adelaide Football Club as a whole is pretty blessed. Um, for all the plaudits that Jason Horn Francis has been given and the forward thinking in his prospects of being an absolute gun of the AFL competition, mm. albeit my knowledge of the broader AFLW competition is quite low, from what I've seen and what I un understand and then what I'm seeing in Matilda Schultz, particularly at her age, I think you got Jason Horn Francis on the men's side of things. I think Matilda Schultz could quite honestly have a similar impact if we're talking about their potential trajectory in their relevant competitions because yeah. for such a young person, she's already dominating other ruck women and she's essentially an extra midfielder. I've said that before. Uh, yeah. Like some of her numbers that she's putting up, like she has the capabilities to really grab the competition by the scruff of the neck over the next five years. And mm. we're so lucky to be afforded her. Um, you know, if there was a national draft when she was drafted, you know, she, yeah, she would have probably gone in the. Uh, uh, like early in the first round, yeah. surely. 
Um, so we're very, very lucky that it was still state based, uh, and yeah, yeah we're, we we're blessed her. with her talents. I think we should we got her as one of those priority signings, but even before whatever the draft was. So yeah, all, all that, all those machinations. But um, fuck it, the Crows got to get have Aaron Phillips for a few years, so they can take they can suffer in their jocks. Um, <laughs> um, my five votes goes to Abby Darrick. I don't think, was, <laughs> yeah. I, don't think I don't think it was even no. in that one for yeah. sure. Um, Not really. Yeah. There was one moment, I think it was in the second quarter, where we were starting to get a little bit of ascendancy. It could have been late in the first quarter too. She had a burst from midfield that was very Jason Horn Francis act but like she just <laughs> burst forward, um all drive, yeah. all Still the power in her legs. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And and with purpose too, and and no doubt about her. It's probably one thing I've overall liked about what the team's doing over the last couple of weeks is like more of the players are very more assured of themselves in because that was probably part of you know some of those early those criticisms that we have, which are very you know we understand why but they're they're valid is just like tentativeness in possession sometimes there's less and less of that across the twenty two over the last few weeks, um in and and Abby Abby's never had that she's one of those ones that over the last couple of years has been one of the driving forces of us going forward. But yeah, in this game, like she, I think she led with 19 disposals um, mm. and 10 of those contested. Uh, she led the team for meters gain 546, um, which was, you know, best only. Like I think, yeah, Angie Foley was the second best, which I only got into one of my mentions. But um, she took, she had six tackles in the game as well. Uh, she had, uh, sorry, I'm just looking for her clearance numbers. Um, she had a four clearance. She just, but just her efforts around, the way she throws her body body around, I think it was looking for her tackle numbers. Um I feel like she had yeah, she had six tackles as well. That's kind of some of her tackles as well were, were such a ferocious nature. Um, the couple that I remember, um just made me so thankful that we the way we snaffled her as well, it wasn't like it was a, so lucky and then to perform yeah. in Western Australia against the Eagles as well as a Western yeah. Australian who was passed up. Uh, in the WA draft, yeah, she could have been draft she year. Easily could have been one of the you know West. Yeah, clearly could have been a West Coast Eagles player. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, but she's just become such a Port Adelaide. She's such a Port Adelaide footballer. The way she goes. Oh, she fits it. in. Yeah, yeah. Um, like a glove. Like yeah, it's it's she fantastic. She's almost in complete control of her game. Yeah. Um, I really, I really look forward to the day where she has the the 19 20 even breaks 25 but goes at the 75 to 80 percent disposal efficiency she was at 68, yeah, 68 for this game yeah. so it's not bad um in the context uh of it all but yeah just like really like one of those elevation games like really catching fire and she had a great game this time around um Is but yeah i look forward to one of those days that some of these types of players tend to have where you go, I either I was there or fuck yeah, I remember that game. Like that was fantastic. Like I'm really yeah. looking forward to that. Yeah, because the impact she has, she could easily be um a vote winner on um, you know, to win that win the whole thing as an individual award. But Yeah, um, I agree. Yeah, yeah, no, she's she's incredible and um oh, geez. Yeah. Like 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 it's it's the growth in players like her and I mean she was pretty elite right from the start for us but yeah um seeing where she is she was elite from the start but she's so much better now and that's what so you see that growth in her and then you see the growth in some of the others and you just, and you still see the ones that are still developing it's just like it's a scary proposition if we go forward and keep developing this group the way they're going um yeah I fucking totally agree that. yeah anyway I'll let you get to your votes now um Alrighty then. Uh, I've already <laughs> mentioned one of the. Uh, alrighty then. Yeah. Um, I like Jim Carrey. Yeah, no, um, that's enough of that's enough of that. Uh, honorable mention. I've already mentioned Ash Saint. Loved her game. Loved how she's building into the season now. My other honorable mention is Ella Bogue. Mm. Um, now for all the. For all the recognition that some of our top end young talent is getting, I'm buying early stock in Ella Bogue because I feel like she is the type of person, a player, 
who her improvement will be incremental progress. And I have no doubt that she will easily play a hundred games for, for our club. She has just a certain, oh, so, she, so she spent 68% time on ground. Um, but when she is on the ground, uh, a, I'm noticing her at all corners of the ground. She's obviously a very hard runner. Um, but, was it the Carlton game or the Richmond game? There's a bit of there's a bit of push and shove. She didn't take a backward step. She gave a little bit back, but I feel like she's part of that group of young players who, again, are trying to look for the best option when they get the football. Mm. But just a fluency in the way that she positions herself, the way that she moves the ball or intends to move the ball, her teamwork. Um, it's all very sample size at the moment, but like I said, if I'm buying early stock in her, I, I definitely expect a good return in years to come. Um, and it's noteworthy that she had those two goal assists uh, to uh, Justine Mules Robinson for both of her goals. Um, it was so very quick thinking kind of stuff, like yeah, yeah, on the ball. For yeah. The ball. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Like she's she's nowhere near our best players yet. But I have no doubt right now that, yeah, um, when she's into her 20s, um, she'll be a very accomplished, very comfortable AFLW footballer. And I think a very well-rounded footballer is what yeah. I'm getting at. Like I said, the stats and and her whole game at the moment are quite sample-sized. But every time I watch her, I mentioned earlier in this season that she easily flies under the radar, and it's probably mm-hmm. because she's not, getting a lot of the ball, which may be her term on ground, but I'm very confident that um, she'll just every game, every year, she'll just get better and better and better and better. And then all of a sudden she'll be, yeah, she'll be one of our more accomplished players. I'm yeah. quite confident of that. Um, but anyway, into my votes, my one vote is Gemma I Houghton. Interject yeah, 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 absolutely. You I, mentioned, yeah, you mentioned sure. about um, a little bit of the, Push and shove. Did you notice a couple of times that just a couple of West Coast Eagles, just a little bit dirty stuff? Like um, Matilda Schultz took a free kick and they they kind of tunneled her a little bit, like as she like hit her. Oh, well, I don't know if I did notice that. Oh, it was earlier in the game. I, I, <laughs> I it just flashed into my mind because I remember watching it and thinking, "Dirty, dirty, dirty." And it was like it was one of I think it was probably it was in the first half. I don't know. Schultz took a free kick from the center, like it was one of those center clearance kind of free kicks and. Just the West Coast player ran like ran into her like clearly after she, she'd taken the kick and she was still like in a kicking motion and just took her out and like the commentators were like oh it took her took Matilda out like a little bit late but like in NFL that would be like a massive penalty because you can't take the kicker out and like uh, on their plant leg or yeah anything like, yeah um and there was another one well, as well. and anyway yeah you just, you just brought up some of that because there was a little bit of, there was a little bit of flying the flag stuff that happened in the game. They got mentioned by the commentators, but it didn't get shown because it was off the ball. Like, and the, and yeah, you know, the way the, yeah, the, yeah. I remember them I, I remember, commenting on a, I remember on Pat, a bit Paps, off the ball. Yeah, Paps is like, "There's a bit going on behind the play, but because there's only one camera, yeah, I guess. But they didn't like, show it." Yeah, yeah. I was like, well, where is <laughs> it? Like, yeah. that's drama. The, the, that's yeah, drama. exactly. Yeah. Love. yeah, but the one that I did see was just like as yeah, Tilds took that kick. They just they, she kind of got tunneled almost, like just yeah, just right. Under, she's in the kicking motion, and that's the most vulnerable position for her, especially a tall player to get taken out. Yeah, it's so, probably in that grey so. area of yeah, because she's in the kicking motion. Yeah, but the ball was like you're fucking... just allowed to make contact. But yeah. you mentioning that reminded me of there was a lot. There was two or three. Clear chopping of the arms to yeah. <laughs> players that just got called play on, and then uh, and every occasion the commentators were like, "Oh, and Saint didn't get the free kick for that, or da da da, uh, no free kick paid, play on." And yeah, so we're all going, "That's a clear chopping of the arms!" <laughs> like, come on. Um. Anyway, yeah, anyway go yeah. ahead with your vote. So I just wanted to bring that up because you just brought up that that, and I was just like, "Did you yeah. notice?" Especially because it was Tilds, I was just like, "Surely," but I was. Just- did Jamie notice? Not Tails. <laughs> Leave <laughs> Tails alone. <laughs> anyway, your votes. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. Um, so my one vote goes to Gemma Houghton. Uh, yeah, we spoke about her X Factor, her impact. Uh, I just, I just love it. Like nine disposals. 
She took three marks, one of which were contested. Um, uh, her five score involvements, which were her two goals, two, and then one direct goal assist. Mm. Uh, five tackles, three of which were inside 50. So, yeah, there's no surprise when we're getting her involved in the game. We're ending up in a pretty positive situational position. Yeah. Uh, yeah, just impact is really getting her into my best players recently. Mm. Uh, and then moving on to my two votes, Caitlin Wendland, after several, several weeks of a lot of hard, unrewarded work, very team orientated work uh, off the ball tackling and things like that. She really had a bit of a breakout game in the sense that she was able to impact in several facets rather than just one or two. She had the 11 disposals, six of which were contested. She went at 63.6%, uh, 325 metres gain, uh, two marks of her own. She kicked two goals, one. Very, gr- very good kick. Left footer, nice yeah. action and straight, which was... Fantastic. Uh, another score involvement on top of her scores. Two clearances of her own, four inside 50s and five tackles. So tackling is, yeah, <laughs> right where it usually is in her regard. But she just, yeah, was able to impact in, in other facets of the game. Good to note that she's an injury replacement player, which brings, just drawing forward to the end of the season, we've got some good players to come back in and we've replaced them currently with some pretty decent players who are yeah. impacting. So, Good situation to be in from a list management point of view, um, but maybe something to ponder as the weeks go on and, and the end of the season uh, comes to a conclusion, whenever that yeah. may be. Yeah, because the there's, later, a of, there's a couple of those. Like, the better. You know, we've talked about Jermak a lot, like she's and Wenlin now yeah. as well. Um, both yeah. of them have, we've kind of talked about a lot, like we've, even if it's not votes, and I'm glad you brought Wenlin into the votes, but we've talked about a lot over the last couple of weeks, just, their impact in moments in the game, whether it be yeah. Wendland as a pressure, like her pressure up forward is good. And she obviously rewarded with goals this week, as you've just noted, but yeah, just, yeah, they, they're both performing above their station as injury replacement players. Like they're actually yeah holding their spot on a side that is having some changes here and there. Um, so yeah, Well, and yeah. Caitlin Wendland is actually younger than I thought she was. Oh yeah, for some reason I thought she she was in her mid twenties, but she's twenty one. Tegan Jermack is twenty two. So if we decide to keep them on, which look, you'd have to say yes. Like you you can, um, they're in what they're doing. Still got plenty of years. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So I gave her a vote. I think it was the last game or the game before, just due to consistent hard work. But she definitely deserved votes in her own right uh, for this game. Uh, three votes, much like you, Maria Maloney. Yeah, not much more to say. She had a goal assist of her own, four score involvements and five clearances. Um, great disposal efficiency, which you listed before. Yeah. Uh, my four votes also goes to Matilda Schultz. Yeah, just an awesome game. She got she actually got the nine coaches votes, uh, which did, yeah just goes to show. Um, uh, but yeah, two two score involvements, one contested mark. So. Yeah, for a tool player, we would want her to mark it a bit more, but I think, yeah, she she went without a mark in a couple of games in a row or, yeah, so just keep building on that. Two score involvement, six clearances, seven inside 50, six tackles, one of those inside 50 and four one percenters, just an outstanding game, uh, which we kind of went on a bit of a, a roll with in your votes and then <laughs> but we can yeah, keep my going five. If you, we can keep going if you want <laughs> uh, oh look yeah i i just i i think i don't know it was our preseason show for the men's season and we were kind of wrapping up last year's aflw comp and yeah. i think i mentioned it then that she's the type of player that you would want to go watch and i think i echoed that again once the this season aflw season started and yeah, there's nothing to go against that sentiment yeah. for me. It, it's just, yeah, I think yeah, the only thing really that, looking forward to the how only she thing progresses. That's good about now is like there's so many more players to go watch now. Like there's just the list is growing <laughs> ex- exponentially this year of how many players you want to go down to Alberton and watch watch these ladies play. Like there's so many good. Yeah, players. speak. Yeah, I completely agree. Of course, and and speaking of which, Abby Garrett gets my five votes. Um, not sure how 
deep. Your stats went for eight clearances is very noteworthy. Three from the center, three each of inside and rebound fifties and six tackles. But um, just on what you were saying, uh, I feel that we've got some X factor in our forward line and our midfield while our defense, I think is quite uh, not workmanlike because they're women, but you get what I'm saying. It's a very um, even, what's it, what's just the, solid. What's the thing in uh, World War Two? Rosie, Rosie the Riveter. What? I just, it was. The, it was. It was. The was thing. that English? <laughs> Sorry, it was the thing. Like, because because in World War Two, like all the men go off to war, so all the, it was yeah, women that were being, and the was, women. Yeah, it was. It was like the, the, it was like industrial remember, work. It was the poster in World War Two from the Americans. Yeah. It was like the lady with the like headband yeah. around, like I'm going to work. Ro- it was like Rosie the Riveter is like her name. Like she was like riveting. Like yeah. So yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. I definitely know what you mean. Work, yeah. work yeah. woman. Ro- like. Rosie the Riveter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rosie the Riveter is what I'm talking about, and like that's a yeah, that's a Portland thing now as well because yeah, Ro- Ro- But anyway, yeah, this, this yeah this completely de- Sorry. derailed your point. Sorry. No, that's okay. It is a good analogy, though, for our defense, because I think they're all just as one big solid unit. I think when we do get that X factor player in the back line, um, wow, like each third will have their own player who puts the fear into the opposition. Mm -hmm. We have that on two lines, but that doesn't take away from our defense because I think think our defense is holding up quite solidly as as a unit. Um, we haven't mentioned Borg this year, but I think she had a couple of really nice moments in this game. That's the one. Yeah, that's the she, one. She's had a few moments. She's she's been good all year, but she's had a few moments where because she gets left out one one on one in a moment, and she gets beaten. And it kind of looks bad, but it's not like that bad because it's the situation yeah. rather than anything. But in this game, she had some moments where she just came in crashing through with a spoil. Or well, she only had one. She only had one disposal. Yeah, she's and I'm pretty she, sure if you look at the stat her, sheets. Her impact is of much other higher. games, yeah, 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 yeah. Her impact is much higher than what her stats will show. I think I, on, I would agree with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would agree with that. And and she was the one that I had in mind that can be the X factor player in the defensive third. She's like uh, an Alex. She, she just needs to. Um, she's she she can be. She an just Alex, needs to grow. Like she can be an just, Alex. She can be an Alex Rance kind of player. I think like just quite like just. Just, just super accountable, yeah. um, can intercept, hopefully, like, that's where you set your sights on. Yeah. Intercept, run off, uh, doesn't take a backward step. Like, she'll probably, yeah, as she grows, um, as she only, matures, she's she'll... Only 20, she's only 21, I think, now still, so I think... Yeah, because she was part of our first intake, so yeah. uh, if I quickly load it up now... Uh, She's nineteen. Yeah. <laughs> so she's Christ, you know, she's even there. I, she's yeah. well, she's taking on a heavy load because I think more often than not, she's, she's taking often... the best or second best uh forward. So yeah. um once she like I said, once she matures, starts getting her hands on the football, I, I am I imagine she's gonna start running through people and she I think she'll she generate looks like she wants to. She's just trying to figure yeah, out. Yeah, yeah. She, she just, just needs a couple of things to marry up. Of- dimensions yeah. of the game and everything like that yeah yeah and then you have your solid contributors like ebony o'day is a, is a wrecking ball but i wouldn't say she's necessarily that x-factor player um she's just like she puts the fear into opposition in a different way <laughs> yeah <laughs> um uh, but I think she yeah has, uh, i think she has like um i'm gonna make an analogy to a baseball movie have you seen bull durham it's my favorite sports movie of all time no, I don't no, think I have. I, I know, I'm gonna. I'll send you a link to the movie. Like, you need to watch that movie because it's just it's a movie about minor league baseball, written and directed by a guy that played minor league baseball in the 80s. It's, it's Kevin Costner, Tim Robbins, like Susan Saran. It's a great. It's. I think it's the greatest sports. Good movie cast. Ever. Yeah, because it, it has such it has all the intricacies, the ludicrousies of sports that only someone that's played it can do. Like you can't write a movie like that. Um, but. Um, yeah, Ebony O'Day. There's, so there's a moment in the movie where Kevin Costner is like catching to Tim Robbins as the pitcher, and like he's kind of playing, he's foxing a little bit with the batter, and he goes, he's just like, he tells Tim Robbins to throw the ball at the at the mascot and just 
tells him to throw that mascot <laughs> as one of his pitches, and then like the batters is like, what this? What's this fucking guy doing? And and Kevin Costner goes, well, this looks at the, pit, the batter and goes, I have no idea where they're going. Like just talking about his own pit. <laughs> so like kind of like Adam Gilchrist just talking, yeah. like saying like I don't, I have no idea where Brett Lee's next ball is going to go. Yeah, or Shane like Warne. <laughs> yeah, and I feel yeah. like that's Ebony yeah. O'Day. Ebony O'Day as a defender is like she just strikes that fear. Is just like you don't exactly know. Like she's incredibly talented. She's just a wrecking ball of a player, and you just don't know exactly. Like you just always know she's around. Yeah. You don't know exactly. Yeah. Like she's just an X factor of a player. And, <laughs> um, that's a it's a really wild analogy I've just made, and it doesn't really exactly make sense because I, I as a big fan of that movie, it's not it's it's not clearly. 1A, 1B, but it's just like, it's more just that vibe vibe thing that you can get right. out of there. I don't know what she's going to do. So, yeah, I don't know. You yeah, can find yeah, exactly. Out. <laughs> yeah. Like, if, you, if, you're, if you're looking, if you're about to collect the ball, like on your forward 50, and Ebony O'Day is about 15 meters away, you don't know what the fuck exactly is going to happen next. Mm. Is she going to come straight at you? Or is she like making a line to where you're looking to pass the ball? <laughs> I don't fucking know. Only Ebony yeah. O'Day knows. And whatever Ebony O'Day is going to do is probably going to be the right thing to do. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, you, there's a good little defensive mix-up working there too, like a defensive build working there too. Obviously, Ange Foley's like your veteran down there. Um, with you know, sadly this year we've we're missing Jan- Janelle down there, who's was a stalwart. Yeah. There. I mean, she was a big part of our first couple of weeks with her intercept marking and just her, her leadership down there. But the fact that that's a probably something to touch on now too, just before we get into finishing up, just how they've managed that because she was a big part of that that mm-hmm. that back line for like the first few weeks and the fact that and it probably would have allowed borg who we were just speaking about to probably flourish a bit more in her own right yeah but things change so yeah uh yeah borg has had to go on the first defender yeah uh yeah uh it would have allowed her much more freedom but yeah she's yeah. uh they've all lifted as a whole which again, yeah, again drives home the fact that like just because there's no X Factor player as such doesn't mean they're not doing their job. They're absolutely doing their job, in my opinion. Yeah, and I think overall across this year we've actually defended quite well. Even you know some of those games that we, I mean those games we played against the top teams like the Kangaroos and the Rich I think teams. it's yeah that Kangaroos game that weather is what a do part you make of it? of it? Yeah, it's it's a it's a weird one. That first quarter, that first half was a bit of an aberration, but they. You know, it's just, yeah, it was one. It, you can only point to that half as the only half of football that was really just terrible. Like, that's the only, and I can't, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I can't help but thinking that perhaps in the last couple of years, that margin may have blown out to 10 goals or 12 goals where we actually fought back and we won yeah. the second half as a whole. So, um, I think that's a real change if we're not getting run over the top of as such. Yeah, um, we haven't been beaten uh, by more than forty points at any point this year, I don't think. So, yeah, and know, that's only that, the once. Yeah, and that that and that happened multiple times over the past couple of seasons. So, yeah, it's, yeah, uh, yeah. Any time we would get beaten by that, like like that in the first half, we would have gotten beaten substantially the last few years. So, yeah, in, incredible stuff from um, the ladies the last couple of weeks, and long may it continue this week as we head into a Thursday night match at Alberton. Get down there. Um I'm gonna be finishing work at about six and then driving straight down there to get there for Yeah, I'm it. keen to I'm keen to get there. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll, I'll see you there. Um yeah, seven fifteen, um, you know, Alberton standard time, as we call it here. Uh at yep. uh, yeah, at Alberton Oval. We're playing Collingwood who are I, I actually don't have a ladder in front of me, but they're in the Collingwood are seventeenth. They're 17th. struggling. Yeah. Um they're unfortunately on the larger end of injury lists. Uh, so it provides a great opportunity to um, start well. If we start well, we can build a f- monumental lead considering where both teams are at at the moment and how, yeah, once you get on top of a side in AFLW, you can really get like yeah. snowball it. Which we haven't had quarters. much of a chance to do. I think our first win, which was against Sydney, which who were a first year team when we beat yeah. them in twenty twenty two. The Western probably... Bulldogs game this year was yeah. quite formidable. Uh, yeah. as the game went on. Well, for we're sure. One by forty. Yeah. I think Sydney's the only team we've ever beaten by I think ten I think we beat them by <laughs> ten goals, and that's the only time we've ever beaten a team by that kind of margin. Mm. Um 
Yeah, so this, as you said, this kind of affords an opportunity to do that kind of game, and and this team deserves that opportunity to actually feel what it what it feels like to dominate a team. Like that's part of growth. Mm -hmm. Growth as a football team is to understand how it feels to exert your influence over an opposition team that is inferior yeah. and it's not to disrespect Collingwood um, but though I will always enjoy every opportunity to disrespect them as a club but um, their football program as you said there's injuries and just that they, that's where they are on the, on the ladder right now and uh, we should be looking to do that and the fact we can do we have the opportunity to do it in Thursday night footy at Alberton um, we get to play mm, Collingwood school holidays so yeah. it should be a decent crowd it should be there. Yeah, there's no excuses not to get down there, really. If you're a Port fan and you love Port footy, um, get down mm. to Alberton on Thursday night. This Thursday night, so two nights. We're, we're recording this on Tuesday night, um, 8th of October. Um, it'll, it'll be released tomorrow morning, which is Wednesday. Wednesday, So, you yeah, know, a day from now, a day from when you're listening, um, get down to Alberton and, and, and get in, get around the girls. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, really looking forward to it because uh, we, we, as you mentioned on Twitter after the game, it's it's chance, like, I mean, Winning two in a row and beating our previous record of wins in a season is one thing. We can now potentially win three in a row, double our best winning season ever, and and get ourselves yeah. firmly entrenched in the top four and and uh, sorry top four top eight and keep mm -hmm. just keep ourselves in the hunt for finals because we uh, making finals this year is kind of the ultimate goal, uh, and being the results of the last couple of weeks, we've actually given ourselves a platform with the, the games where we've gotten through a tough period of fixtures and we have an opportunity to get a few wins in the next oh, yeah. season and, and, yeah, and potentially absolutely. play finals for the first time, which um, would be an incredible result from this year. They should 100% be looking to not only get into the top eight, but push top six, yeah. maybe just looking at the ladder now. Uh, we're ninth on 12 points and 103%, and the West Coast Eagles are eighth uh, on 16, so a win, a win ahead of us, but on 92%. And they play Hawthorne, who are third. I believe that is away as well, so it's a Hawthorne home game. Yeah. <laughs> Excuse me. So if, if we win... Uh, we go into the top eight. Essendon are, are, are the other team on 16 points with a similar percentage to us, but they uh, play Western Bulldogs, uh, who are 14th on the ladder. So um, a great opportunity. Uh, Col I just checked Collingwood kicked one goal against Richmond and suffered a six-goal loss um, in in their last match. So, And I think from scanning on Twitter over the weekend and such, I think maybe the opinion was that they were probably a little bit lucky to get that one goal. So, And we, to, we, we've talked about it the last couple of weeks. We played a lot better against Richmond than that. So, yeah. Yeah, exa yeah exactly. Yeah. yeah. So it's a pretty, it's a pretty recent comparison. And I guess the biggest thing is, and I would desperately hope that they would be talking about it because our starts have been, like you said, slow three out of the last four games. Mm -hmm. If we start this game really well, it, like um, we're in for a good night, I, I yeah. believe, on, on Thursday night. Uh, because after that, you've got, I think we've got St Kilda, yeah, who are in, in, a, in and around where we are. And that's on Friday night at Alberton next week, uh, the week after. Yeah. Yep, yep. <laughs> then the Gold Coast, who are last. And we finish up against the Giants, who are also near the bottom of the ladder. They're sixteenth at the moment, so we play the bottom three sides over the next four games. Yeah, uh, uh, like that just that just says it all. So we should one hundred percent be expecting to play finals at this point in time. And I think a lot of what they've shown would suggest they're on the right track to do so. Yeah, they can hold up and play. Like, yeah, we're not sitting there saying they're going to win a grand final this year or win, you know. I think that's an outlandish expectation yeah. at but this point they, in time. Their, their brand of footy is building to be one that's not easily beaten. Yes, maybe skills and experience will tell, um, as we've seen against uh, the better sides, whether it be Richmond in the first quarter or the Crows across the game. But, you know, the Crows game was close right up until the last 10 minutes or whatever. And, um, you know, we've, we've shown across the last couple of years, beyond the first showdown, we've 
matched up reasonably well against the Crows. Just some run, run and carry and experiences as shown in the ultimate battle. Well, but, and even um, yeah, uh, yeah. The, those free kicks that we gave away really separated yeah, the game yeah, margin wise. Absolutely, actually, so, yeah, yeah, yeah. This year in particular, um, yeah, yeah. We've um, we've put it up to some of the better quality sides in the competition. Yeah. Uh, and you can still so, see, like, we, we talk about it week to week. Like, there's a lot of parts of our game that can improve. Marking is a big part of it. Like, we we talked about in this one, I think the marks were... Uh, we're at 29. It? Yeah, 29 to 58. So they literally doubled our marks numbers. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, yeah. But, but... But 29, I think, is a similar number to the... Uh, previous game against Carl- Carlton. Yeah. yeah. I yeah, think we, the marks inside 50 are a lot more even. where we like got ahead in this game. Like yeah. Eagles still had a couple more, but making sure we also but almost matched what, them in that regard is yeah. what kept us ticking over score wise. Yeah. And that's why it's always interesting. That it's why you always want to read stats with a, I think I mentioned my history degree earlier. <laughs> like, yeah, numbers are only numbers are only as important as the context of them, and um, it's like our disposal numbers over the last couple of weeks. We've lost the disposal count quite significantly, but it's what you do with the ball and and what we're doing with the ball and how we, you know, move it forward with 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 purpose is really really important. And it's just it's just so much fun to see this team actually starting to play with confidence. I think that's probably the mm. the closing point I'd love to make is just over the last two weeks. You've seen this team because you and I have talked about it in the first two to three, four weeks, probably just the tentative nature at times. Um, even yeah. Piper, you know, someone like Piper Window, who we haven't mentioned much tonight, but has been a big part of the last few weeks. You know, the first few weeks, you could see that the talent, she was a little bit tentative with the disposal, but she's just, you know, players like her, she she's epitomizes the growth week to week, to week and that's what's really cool. Mm. It's week to week. It's not just. Um, because we we're still in the FOW competition that you know week to week progression is really important because they only get to play ten games a year. We just talked about the Justin mm. Mules games, yeah. So, um, yeah, watching that progression week to week and just and just how much our progression as a team, despite the you know we're talking about um, and I should, I should bring up right now. Um, I meant to bring it up when you when we were talking about Abby earlier, but Pride round this week, incredible Guernsey, by the way, yeah. Um, yeah. really, really dynamic design. I love it. I love the the striking, the striking bars of it, and just how it's designed. The pride around Guernsey. Um, I'll say it right now: if you're listening to the po- this podcast and you have any issue with pride round, then it's not the podcast for you. Because <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're definitely yeah. allies on this podcast yeah. for sure. Yeah, yeah. Now, if you're sitting there, sitting there going, "Why isn't there a straight round?" Then just, just yeah. un- unsubscribe right now. Um, absolute power to the ladies um, and the and those in um, in the pride community. Um, an incredible pride Guernsey run. Once, once again, we've had three now, and um, we've we've absolutely hit hit it out of the park with every every single pride Guernsey we've had. Mm. Um, and this one designed by Abby and and Henny Ewings is at a partner as well, which it's really yes good, yes good, good to see her. Good for her that. to still be involved in that way. Yeah yeah, and in the promotion of it and all that stuff. Are really good to see her still. In, yeah, as you said, still involved. I hope in she's like just on her though. I hope she's in a good place because. Her looking at this side from afar, it had, if you, if she is in the right mental space, which I hope she is, yeah, that would surely be a tantalising prospect to just kind of enter back into that team yeah. at yeah. some stage, whenever that may be. Um, so yeah, I hope she's I hope she's doing really well. I hope I hope she comes back um, mm. uh, because <laughs> it'll only make our side even better. Yeah, and we we have fond fond memories of her just slogging them from fifty and whatever, like some of those highlights of her in those yeah, first absolutely. couple of years. Um, and in Indy Tahoe, by the way, was a was a part of the um, advertising for all the the Pride Guernsey as well. So yeah, Pride Round coming up, um, and really really looking forward to seeing the girls get out there, get out there in that kit. Um, yeah, yeah, no, and incredible to yeah, just um, have the FLW um, show that part of. Like, cause I, I, the AFL men's, I know we have, I think Sydney and another team, I don't know, Sydney often have mm. an AFL men's pride round, but we need to get pride round into the men's competition properly as well. Um, I absolutely believe like at least one yeah. year. Um, the men's I think it just, yeah it, yeah, it creates a broader 
societal to butcher that word just conversation discussion issue yeah. like you, you need yeah. to for, you need to unfortunately yeah yeah the the scenario in the men's competition is is not where it needs to be in that regard um you know and we know I, as a as a club I would hate team. for a family member of mine or a friend a cl- a friend of not even a close friend just a friend of mine um I would hate for them to have to hide their identity just for fear of backlash and all of that mm-hmm. so the men's game has got a, a ways to go in that regard but credit to the women's competition from day dot it's just been all encompassing like yeah. you know it, everyone is welcome everyone is free to express themselves and their identity um so it's credit to the competition in that regard and and the people who perform uh on and off the field in that competition yeah yeah no absolutely couldn't have said it better myself um to finish off uh we'll just touch on i guess um I don't know, we only have to do five ten minutes here but we're in trade period now. Obviously, we've already said we'll do a full spectrum review of the season and everything that happens once we know the full details of any trades um, or list management decisions that happen over the next couple of weeks. But um, Dan Houston saga continues. Uh, Collingwood are in the discussions now, and obviously Port Adelaide have had uh, a young, talented Collingwood small forward in Joe Richards nominate for, as his preferred des- destination, which adds an interesting wrinkle to the Dan Houston discussions because Collingwood could swing um, a tantalizing first round pick. I think they have the 13th pick uh, if uh, off the top of my head around that. I think um, they're hoping to get it off of Gold Coast right. in there a deal go. that would need to come prior to a deal yep. with Port Adelaide. There we go. Um, so, you, yeah, um, yeah how, how do you feel about... Um, I guess before we get, I mean, Dan Houston stuff, um, Joe Richards, I don't know much about him. I I know I've watched him play. Um, he's only played nine or ten games, I think, but he was, mm. he. I think he won best first year player at Collingwood this year. Uh, and Craig McRae said that he was looking forward to Joe Richards wearing a Collingwood Guernsey for many <laughs> years to come. Very cheeky because he would have known yeah. at that point in time. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I like to think that I've got my finger on the pulse of a lot of the AFL landscape and mm. fringe players and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I've got to be honest, I don't have very much knowledge of him at all. What I have been same able page, to gather. Sa- same book as me then, because I, yeah. 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 I've yeah. Like, na- you know, with, I've with, heard, his, heard with, his name this year, so I know he's played, but like, yeah. I just haven't heard him that much. I th- you know, just drawing back to last off season's trade and, and pre agency period, like I knew Jordan Sweet was on the fringes. I knew a fair bit about him. Um, you know, Asava Radigalia, like that saga went over two years. Um, yeah. so time to learn. But yeah, for the first time in a while, I'm just like, all right, I don't know much about this player, but what I have gathered is that uh he's uh good in traffic, uh a fairly accurate kick from from what I understand. Um, I think uh, we've obviously sold it to him that he would be included in a group of like the small the small forward brigade. Mm-hmm. Uh, but it, I think he's twenty four, which which says to me that they're hoping that if we secure the deal, he has a good preseason and expected to play round one. So his mm-hmm. super, the aim is to supersede uh, your likes of Frankie Evans, Jed McEntee, Put pressure on Quinton Narkle uh, to go along with uh, Rioli, who hopefully has a <clears throat> excuse me great preseason. DBJ as a senior leader and a number one pressure player up forward, and then Sam Pau Pepper obviously coming straight back in. Um, so just really wants, I, I imagine Chris Davies, Jason, uh, Jason Cripps, they want to thicken up our small forwards because as yeah. we've seen in recent years, the small forwards tend to be the ones that kind of take a hold of your bigger games, particularly finals. So you need to have those guys around. And our forward line as a whole will look very different with the potential of, of Jack Lacocious coming in and yeah. question marks on Marshall from a injury and concussion point of view, but Lord from a experience, form, maturity point of view. We may be a fairly medium to small size forward line. Um so, yeah, I have confidence if we do secure the trade, which 
history would say that it gets done. I have confidence in our coaches, like I've mentioned plenty of times before, to get him in a good space to impact early. Um, and then it's up to him to to take the baton from there. Um, what I would say, though, just drawing it back to Dan Houston, is that I think we can facilitate a trade for Joe Richards separate to the Dan Houston trade. And yeah. while I think like, the did, Houston did, trade cause, cause is... Because Carl- Carlton is still coming hard for Houston. Like, Justin Leppich... I think the like, thing that makes it yeah. so Sorry, Justin Leppich is noteworthy... A- Collingwood, but the, the Carlton and he Collingwood is. are both, um, yeah, yeah, Carlton and Collingwood are both coming hard for him still. So, is it, is and it, North it, Melbourne is still kind of lingering there in the background, and and they've got like the picks. I've, they've got the picks we want. <laughs> like if they, they've got the picks. Yeah. Well, and the other thing about it too uh, is, yeah, cool, Carlton Collingwood. It might be where Dan Houston would prefer to go, although he said that he just wants to go back to Melbourne. I think he's there was also, a point on radio that he's happy to stay, which I, I love. I still love. Like I'll respect yeah. him forever for that. Oh, it gives us so much power in this scenario. Hasn't, he hasn't thrown the, the baby. The, you know, was it the baby? Out baby the, out with the bathwater. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not a parent, so I don't know that one as well. But <laughs> you tell me more about that one. Um, <laughs> That's going back a, a couple of centuries. <laughs> um, um, but uh, yeah, the point that was made, I think today or yesterday, was that. Or want to be careful not to give Dan Houston to a team that we're going to contend with. And it's something that Geelong it's a bit, it's a were firm with. Thing. Yeah. It's a big yeah, thing with in American The sports. Asava. Yeah. yeah. Like Geelong held off because they didn't want to just hand us a player that they thought they were going to come up against in finals. Finally enough, we did <laughs> this year. Um, it out too badly two years, him. two years later, less said about that, the better. Yeah. So that's where I'm going. Well, North Melbourne have the picks. Highly unlikely that they would be contending. They may be more competitive next year, especially if they have a Dan Houston in their team. Mm. Um, but that's where I think, yeah, uh, it would be interesting to see where the lever gets pulled um, yeah. and how that then translates into our dealings with with uh, Gold Coast with Jack Lacocious. So I'm more leaning to handing him off to North Melbourne, particularly if it gets us a decent pick and, potentially co-opting our way ahead of so I'll put it this way being being the first South Australian team with a draft like draft pick in the upcoming draft if that makes sense yeah 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 somehow somehow shoehorning our way ahead of our rival in this state to to you know potentially in, take into, the best into, into the strong talent. draft yeah 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 because they that you know that they want to be in that um, yeah, no, it is interesting that you bring, yeah, because you think about sports across, like, you know, Manchester United and Liverpool haven't transferred players between each other for, you know, fucking, mm. I think there's one, you know, Michael Owen, who went from Liverpool to Real Madrid to Newcastle and then went to Man United <laughs> and was still... Man, you would love to do a deal right now, yeah. just on oh, that, no, and Liverpool... sorry for any United fans listening. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, suffering your jock. Um, but, yeah, just... It is um it is an interesting thing to bring up though, is like how I don't I don't think ever list management it would be interesting to know how much they think about that. Because it is you are absolutely strengthening direct opposition in Collingwood and Carlton at the moment. Because Collingwood you would I'm I'm interested in Collingwood because I, I think I was watching in one of the AFL shows on Fox Video and Collingwood's list is gonna go off a cliff Pretty at old. some point. Yeah, you when you look at the Oscar Elliott's, your Jack Crisps, your Pendlebury's, your Side Bottoms, your Oscar Elliott's, your uh, I might be starting to repeat. There's a six, seven, eight players that are north of thirty. Um, mm. So how they they'll list- be competitive. It's they'll it's competitive, the Geelong but- ethos, you know. Yeah, but- senior having a contingent of senior players makes you competitive and gets you into finals. Yeah. But how long that lasts for them? But yeah, yeah, Carlton's mm. the one. Carlton's the one I'm probably a little bit more wary about strengthening. Uh, but yeah, I mean, North Melbourne could come up pretty quick once they get a couple of players in with some of the young talent they have. So um, yeah, but I'd like North Melbourne's pick above anyone else's. So mm. yeah. well, and the fact that he said that he wants to go back to Victoria, yeah, he's um, nominated, he's contracted, but... like yeah, yeah, 
It's a, it's a really unique position. I think it's again speaks to probably some respect with Port Adelaide and just his position is like he's actually not looking to go anywhere in particular. He's just it's lifestyle purely, and um, I'm sure he probably has some clubs personally that he prefers, but he's quite open. Um, it's a really it's a really really good position for Port to be in. Um, mm. In that negotiating aspect of it is just like, yeah, Dan Houston wants to go back to Victoria, but he doesn't nominate anyone. Just like come at us. Come at us with your yeah. deal, and yeah, I have confidence that come the end of the trade period, we'll we'll get what we think is is valuable. We'll be in a good position, I think. Yeah. So far, no, we've think... targeted a couple of players. We've missed out on them. That's that. In terms of our other talent acquisition uh, prospects, uh, it looks like we're on track for what we wanted to do. So. You take the good with the bad. It's not our first yeah. rodeo in this regard. So um, we're, pretty, we're pretty deep in midfield. Yeah. We're pretty deep in and beyond losing Dan Houston. I think we're we're reasonable. We've talked about it before. Where you don't replace his kick, but we're we've got some reasonable prospects in the running halfback options. Yes, you don't replace mm -hmm. him ever, but we're in a you know to adjust with him going if he does go. Because we know if he does go, we should be getting a decent hand back. So it's just like... Yeah, I sit here with confidence for that reason. Yeah, yeah, same. Um, that's about it for on the men's front, I think. I, I, if I'm forgetting something, I, you can remind me. But I think that's really the only story that's been bubbling over the last week is really Dan Houston and then what we get in return. And then obviously just the Joe, the Joe Richards wrinkle. In How it. that dominoes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and it could be completely separate. So... Yeah, that's about it on that front. And um, I guess we should touch on the best and fairest was last week. Um, obviously, Zach Butters back to back best and fairest, which um, yeah, we we will announce our uh, we we'll, we'll do when we do our season review. We'll announce our goal of the week and goal of the week, goal of the year, and um, Sweeney of the year, and obviously our player of the year, which it's probably no surprise it'll be Zach Butters. So um, not not afraid to announce that here because if you've been listening look he to might be he might be near the top somewhere yeah yeah um but i'll, I'll have a top 10 list any surprises for you in in the from the best, best and fairest not really i think a few people brought up brandon zerk thatcher being in the top 10 didn't surprise me at all um mm. I, I like the fact that he was i like you know with how yeah. how our team votes for that i think that's um i know i know he was he was getting a few votes from you and I on our, how we do ours. He didn't quite crack our top 10. Um, but I wasn't surprised that he did in how our votes go. I think that's just a reflection of how, like, you know, it's like that, you know, there's been a few um, votes in the past few years that you, you just see just how they go. And generally when you've got an out and out best like Zach Butters or, you know, Rosie in pre years previous or whatever, you know when someone's going to win, but, yeah, I, I like it when a Brandon Zerk Thatcher or an Aaliyah, you know, Aaliyah coming up third, uh, I think, mm. came third. Um, I like that because it shows yeah, he that did. Our, our votes reflect a little bit more of a team ethos than, um, you know, a Brownlow voting system and, and whatnot goes. And yeah. yeah. Really, really, yeah, there's no surprises for me. Um, and I'll let you speak if, if there was any for you, but I actually more wanted to bring up, there was a few people that said, oh, Brandon Zerk Thatcher was, you know, really underrated this year. And I was just like, that that actually, for me, watching across the year and you and I talking in the podcast, I was like, no, that was actually a reflection of how I think his year went. Um, mm -hmm. Is yeah. he deserved to be up there? And I wasn't. I wasn't, he did a lot of jobs. Yeah, across I wasn't, the year. I wasn't surprised to see Brandon Zerk Thatcher in the top ten. But was there any surprises for you in that? Or um, no, not of uh, similar similar regard. I wasn't surprised to see Zerk Thatcher there and, and thereabouts in in the top 10 mm -hmm. maybe thought ollie wines would have po uh, polled a bit better yeah, um i thought tenth. it was interesting he, he was 10th yeah, yeah. Uh, which is I'm pretty, still, you know again pretty forward, good but i'm pretty sure he's in our top five so um, yeah um top five or six i thought it was interesting that rosie polled quite well uh considering his year and i guess yeah just kind of goes hand in hand with our assessments of Rosie as a whole. Uh, sure, it wasn't an exemplary year, but it was nowhere near as bad as what it was made out to be at frequent stages of the season. Um, and, yeah, we'll, we'll get to some of our 
improve and you know our our, our forward kind of prospects yeah. like in the year to come when we do our our a season wrap up but mm, yeah i just thought that was it was comforting to me i yeah. thought it was funny um because yeah he would have got votes because of some of the things that he does do that a lot of people don't think he does uh, which was great yeah yeah and which we've brought up particularly in the finals and of recent weeks and his uh some of the pressure things he does and tackles and all that stuff so yeah yeah no it was um looks like it was a fun night um friend of the pod emma on i don't know if you follow her on yep. instagram but yeah 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 <laughs> um i asked her out the night when she was like i'm fucking high over um so shout out to <laughs> she was there um shout out to former um port player tom logan who i have a um, relationship with completely outside of Port Footy. Um, he's an Oregon Ducks fan, so shout out to him. But he, he was there as well and had a good night. Um, it looks like it was just a fun night to be a part of. I shout out to Fake Ken too. Loved that segment with uh, Rizza, <laughs> where uh, Jared Walsh called senior Jared. coach of Port Adelaide Football Club Ken Hinkley up, and Paul Rosonico came up and <laughs> said a few Ken Hinkley platitudes, which yeah, yeah. I thought that was a an immense moment of the night. Yeah. That was great. Yeah. Shout out. Yeah. Rosonico, um, who obviously, um, uncle of the great Kirsty Lamb, who will be back this week. I should have, we should have made most likely. Yeah. yeah. She, she's available from concussion and you mm. know, she Sachi was, obviously... sign was managed too. So whether she comes back in, <laughs> just going back to AFLW. Yeah. We've got some list management things to deal with in list AFLW. Cause you know, Sachi Simon, Kirsty Lamb are no slashes on the sideline. Um, yeah. But yeah, it sounds like it was a great night at the uh, at the um, port. Um, yeah, I want to try and get there next year, I reckon. Because I thought about it this year, it's just like I got so much going on. But I was like, Fuck, I need to go and have some beers and just. It would be a good night. Yeah, yeah. and yeah, and shout out to Jared Walsh for um, yeah doing a great job on the night too, because he does a great job for Port Footy and he's a great Port man as well. It's um, good to have an authentic Port fan man, you know, just as part of the the whole show and. Um, does a great job. So, yeah, that about wraps it up for this week, though. Um, got through a lot, actually. Um, good, good review. Yeah. Another, another, another great win for the dub. Um, and yeah, in two nights from now, um, obviously uh, we're recording. We're just finishing this off on Tuesday. It's just about ten thirty on Tuesday night. So, um, we're going to be finishing off um, our, our next AFLW game about two two days from this moment. So, uh, yeah. Get around the ladies, uh, get down to Alberton if you can on Thursday night, if you're listening to this in the next day or so. Um, yeah, Thursday night, Alberton. No better place to watch footy, whatever the fucking competition be. But the fact that you can watch AFL football at Alberton and watch Port Adelaide play Collingwood at Alberton, I think that is a special thing and you should get around mm-hmm. it. So. And, yeah. you know, not wanting to, you know, read into the tea leaves too much, but, you know, a fairly good chance based on how we're playing, based on where Collingwood's at, fairly good chance that hopefully we can go down there if we can apply ourselves to what we've been doing over the last couple of weeks. There's no, there's no reason we can't come out of there with a win. So, yeah, Thursday night beers, school holidays, you know, make sure someone's driving responsibly and, and everyone else enjoy yourselves. <laughs> That's it. It should be an entertaining night. Thanks yeah. for listening, everyone. Yeah, nothing more to say. Khan the lady pair. Go the pair. <laughs>